I'm going to tell you a little bit about Imada um, and a little bit about the uniqueness of, of this group. Um, and for all of you who have programs, how the order will go is after we do the overview, we're actually going to break into uh, groups, the tribes that we've actually represented. You're going to drift back up to the offices, and we're each going to give you a little bit about our specialties. And we want to engage you. We actually want to get some information from you and feedback in terms of here are the issues that we see as clinicians for the community. Um, and we have some ideas about that. But we want to be open to those who are most important to us because in your experiences, you have valuable ideas that we need to also have and keep in mind as we move forward with this. So there'll be that opportunity as well. So for right now, what I'll do is, is I'll say a little bit about um, the, the four of us um, from my perspective. Uh, Imada, first of all, uh, is, you know, our, our vision is absolutely for the African American community. I'm um, a community of color, um, and we don't turn away anyone. Um, but in terms of who we're about, we all have uh, forged a friendship and connection out of similar work. All four of us have worked in Watts um, at various points in time, and we've worked together as co workers. And for those of you who are not from Southern California, the Watts area and, and the amount of clients who actually it's astronomical. The, the inflow in terms of the need is amazing. And so these are, uh, we represent four clinicians who for years have been dealing with some of the most difficult uh, mental health issues in the community. And from my perspective, what I actually appreciate about us as a group, each person represented here, they are people who I know personally who through years of that work and, and the demands of that work has not burned out they've not lost their compassion or their passion for the mission, and they've maintained that. And if any of you are familiar with county work um, and just the demands there, that's one of the realities. Some of the clinicians themselves, the people who are there to provide the help, burn out, they need to go on vacation sometimes, um, and they keep working, and in some ways they become ineffective. We have represented here folks who managed to keep that vitality, kept that emotional involvement and engagement, despite things that would cause burnout. So it's our hope in terms of the modest vision that not only would we reach the community with the help that's needed, and there's opportunities to do that now, like never before, given access to health care that we're expecting. But in addition, Amada would be a place where the clinicians would actually be such that we would keep our emotional vitality. Clinicians who come to work at Amada and provide those services would be able to maintain that balance, would be able to engage with the community. Um, and that's our hope for Amada. Not only do we envision Amada being able to help provide these services, but providing services to the community is just not enough. There are a lot of things that prevent the community from reaching out and connecting with those services. Anybody who's worked in, in this domain, and some of you have worked in the mental health field, you know that there's just a history of stigma that all groups face. For the African American community, it, it's particularly important to note that sometimes a lot of our members come to mental health jail system, new systems where the, the help that they're receiving actually feels like it's a part of the institution and they have bad experiences with that. So these are folks who are going to be very guarded in terms of reaching out for the help that they need and it's understandable. Part of what we want to do is we don't want to just eradicate those barriers without understanding why people are apprehensive about that because those are protective measures. In addition to those, that though, there are a lot of folks in the community who even if they know about services, there's just stigma there. And so we need to have efforts that not just open the doors, but we actually engage the community. So all of us have been a part of various panels in the community when different issues come up. The Zimmerman case, um, women's health, um, an annual women's health event that comes forward. We're there and we're present in the community in those ways and speaking to the issues and trying to actually address the needs in the community. So we're actually putting efforts to actually extend into the community and, and reach a hand out. and not expecting that people will reach a hand out in order to get the help that they need. So we have a, a lot of effort involved in this mission. We're glad that you're a part of it. Uh, we look forward to sharing with you more about the particulars that each of us actually do. Um, yeah, and with that, I will actually um, turn this over to uh, Michelle. If you can, what, what we'll do is we'll, we'll have each of the groups, maybe maybe just have your folks stand so we can acknowledge who's who, and then we'll transition. All right. Well, my people stand up. <laughs> Those that I've invited, family and friends, and sick. And quickly, how to say who they are. And first, let me start with my mother, Sadie Lane, who is, because of her, I'm 
here in many ways at one. Um, then I have my in-laws, Johnny and Deborah and our my little cousin, T.T. Seriani. Then I have with me as well friends from college, Jason and Priscilla, and Ron. So these are the folks that I have with me. They're, yeah, my wife. <laughs> you have to get her. You have to get her. Oh, there, there she is. There, she's up. And you share. They're both up there. That's my son. So, those are, that's my family. And I'm just very appreciative for you all being here, sharing this moment with me and my friends and my colleagues. So, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.
And so just tell you a little bit about um, what we've been doing, our specialty, and then also um, we want to engage you and find out your thoughts about it, about the community, about little health, how we can be more helpful, just about the business, any business tips, you know, as we're growing. So um, so the, the first thing, um, when I started in private practice, this young lady right here got me in private practice like three years ago. I actually joined this practice in Manhattan Beach. Um, and Rakesha was leaving and called and had me start, and I had always wanted to do that. So I started in with somebody else's practice, which was really neat to see how they did it. And then the, the, um, these, I, you know, we've been talking about these guys, like, hey, you want to just share office space? And then it turned into, oh, well, so-and-so's interested in opening a practice, and, and then Rick was interested, and then all of a sudden, initially it was just Yoshino and Steve and I. Jeez. Yoshino and I were going to share an office because we live in the, in the South Bay, and then it, it just started expanding. We started having meetings, and next thing you know, we're incorporating and lawyers and all this stuff. Um, but um, I started back then working with women. It wasn't intentional, um, but um, I started working with women because I was there at night by myself. I didn't feel comfortable doing therapy with men. Um, unless they were part of a couples, you know, or family system. So I just started, kind of fell into this, this specialty of working with women's issues, which are just basically anyone's issues, but we know women can be the people that come to therapy the most. So um, here we started, we actually um, have been meeting for a year, almost a year and a half, and we, we opened here six months ago. So we opened in February, and I left the other practice, and basically, Several of my clients followed me over, which was great. And then um, I got more clients since I've been here. Um, when I'm working with here in private practice, mostly like mood disorders, like depression, anxiety, um, OCD. So I've had a few people that have severe OCD hoarding, where you know we have to go to the home, and like something you see on a TV show. And so um, those are really hard to do in private practice. Um, family therapy. I also deal with um, young teenage girls, so ranging from 14 to 18, and um, and those are really fun. Um, I'm trying to actually refer the children over to to Dr. to Steve because he's a child psychologist. He's, that's his thing. Um, but every now and then I'll get a child, and when you te treat a teenager, you treat a family. So I always I had a family session with with a family last week, which is like couples therapy, really. Uh, and what do I mean by that? Um, communication breakdown, communication issues, um, misperceptions about, like a lot of assumptions about things, and um, basically working on communication skills. So, um, and Sandy and I work together at Harbor, and um, so I bring a lot of what I've learned at Harbor UCLA um, here, which is cognitive behavioral therapy. It's like a research-backed um, treatment, um, and then this thing called EBT, so for folks that have suicidal thoughts or self-harm, things like that. Um, so I think I'm, uh, now what's happened in this location is we've pulled folks from LMU, so I've gotten some professors um, that want to work on like performance anxiety issues, um, writing block, writer's blocks, which is, I like that, it's, very, it's kind of like coaching in, in a way. Um, and then also I have some students now that I've gotten from Pepperdine University who are in their doctoral program and it's recommended that they do therapy um, as part of their treatment, part of their, their curriculum. So, um, so yeah, it's interesting. Often people will, will present with what we call a V code, and Rikisha and Sandy know what I'm talking about because they're both mental health um, therapists, they're both professional mental health professionals. But V codes are like the lightest kind of issues you can deal with: parent-child problem, relational problem, um, phase of life problem, like dealing with the loss of a loved one or divorce or something like that. So usually in private practice, it's a whole different clientele. Um, so we think, so we think, and then sometimes you get into working with folks and you find out there's a lot more severe things going on. Um, but fortunately it's not, the, the folks that I work with are not at the level where they need hospitalization or anything like that. Um, and um, in terms of ethnic um, background, I, we, we actually started out maybe 40, 50% African American, 50% um, white, and now it's kind of spread to 70% white, 30% um, black, or maybe 60-40, I would say. Um, the neat thing is we're getting out there, we're getting in the community, and Kathy's helped us get, get out in the community and do um, pa panels and things like that. Um, the more that we get our name out there, we'll, we get calls from folks to come in. 
But there's such stigma with African Americans, even African American women, uh, and they'll come after their friends, uh, tell them, "Oh, girl, you should just go, um, call, you know, get some help." And when they come, they really enjoy it. So I'm starting to get referrals from folks that are that are um, coming for treatment. So the other thing that's interesting that I didn't necessarily go out advertising. Um, was um, Christian psychologist, and I'm getting a lot, somehow I'm, when you Google me, that comes up, people will tell me, oh, I want a Christian psychologist, how did you find me? Oh, I Googled you, so, um, well, we blog, I blog and all that, but, so I've been getting a lot of people across ethnic backgrounds um, that want Christian um, psychotherapy, so that is something totally different than, I get it a little bit at the county, but here, where I'm getting more and more calls, I think the last three referrals that I had were people wanting Christian counseling. So um, wanting Christian therapy, wanting to integrate that. And I'm, you know, it's been 10, how many years since we graduated? 2004, 10 years or something. So it's interesting integrating that. Well, what do you mean? I have some pastors I'm dealing with. I've dealt with pastor couples. Um, that's very interesting. <laughs> but um, yeah, the couples, I, the pastors and their wives and it's just like what you would think sometimes, you know, when you hear um, some of the challenges. Um, so, um, yeah, so I'm getting a lot of, a lot of that. And I hope that Or feel that needs to take place. I think just more awareness. People, there's just a lot of taboo in the community about mental health issues, um, disorders. No one wants to be labeled as having a mental disorder. So that's why even if they know that there are services available, they're not going to go for them because they think that it's a mission of, you know, something's wrong with me or um, be that crazy person. Right. Right. We don't want to be called crazy or unstable or any of those things. So that's why you see, uh, like even now, it's with the minor binds and right. some of our issues, you know, being yeah. diagnosed as schizophrenic and whatnot. Here's someone who's obviously wealthy and had some issues but wouldn't even go seek help. And, having hope mandate to her still doesn't really want it. It's just, and then people see that and they're like, well, I don't want to be like that, but even the way it's handled, it's, it brings more negative attention to it versus saying, here's someone who needs help, this is something that can be treated effectively. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't have to be um, a life ending or it doesn't have to have a negative connotation to it. Right. But that's how it's always portrayed like in the media. And it's just really, that, and I, you also see that developed in the younger children, you know, high school mm -hmm. and whatnot. So that's where you're seeing a lot of issues. Some of the people who've been doing the shootings and things right. like that in high school, they have issues. And they right. have issues that could have been addressed early on and caught or they were made aware that, you know, this isn't normal to feel like that, but there's a place for me that I can open up and say, mm -hmm. I can talk about that. Mm -hmm. I just think it's just awareness and getting rid of that type of thing. Yeah, yeah. And people are afraid of that. They just don't know how to get help. They don't know how to get help. And so creating that awareness, creating that educating people about what's going on with mental health. How do you identify some signs, some symptoms? If there's a couple of things I could leave you with today is maybe looking at feelings, thoughts, and behaviors. If those things start to impact your level of functioning, then, you know, there may be some concern. People around you are saying, hey, you know, something's not right, something's, you know, you haven't been hanging out, you haven't been going, you know, doing your regular activities, you're not the sort of person you used to be. You know, then maybe there's some concern. Uh, looking at feelings. Oh. Well, I feel that because I work in the emergency room, so I come into contact with a lot of um, oh, yeah, patients yeah. with you psychiatric mm -hmm. issues, either because they're not taking their medication or um, substance abuse, plus not taking their medication, just, mm -hmm. you know, it's a big problem. Um, I feel that most of the patients that come in don't think that they need help, right? It's the resistance. Right. They feel that, that everybody else is against them. It's like the paranoia and stuff. So I feel that a lot of the healthcare workers as well need more education. True. Um, instead of just labeling the patient. Um, in nursing school, you just get like one one little quarter of, of psychic uh, mental health. Teach like instruction when it's it's a major major mm -hmm. issue. It's coming, you know, like more people are. It's it's more uh, prominent now. Like more people are co having, uh, you know, the AD. What is it? AD, ADHD. AD, AD, AD. You know, all that's coming up, and and the healthcare workers aren't being. You don't get. It's like your education stops, but I don't know how to explain it. Like the focus isn't anymore. 
kind of like you just label the patient like all oh, 5150 there you know okay. instead of like yeah. Yeah. like um aftercare like discharge health you know what i mean mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's why i think in the school system there's got to be some kind of way to identify these children other than waiting on parents because i think a lot of parents I don't know if it's the embarrassment thing no. or yeah or whatever. Right. So they don't want it to admit something's wrong. Right. 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 So in the school system, seems like they should have more of an education uh, classroom setting for the teachers to understand how to help identify these children. Um, I went to Open House a few weeks ago, and it was very interesting to me because. That is not my field, this at all. But being around you, <laughs> a few other people here, I came back home and I told my husband, I says, out of 32 kids, I probably would say 25 of them are ADHD. I had never seen so much chaos yeah. in one room. And then I'm told by the child, this is all day, every day. You know, and I think, well, okay, somebody's got to be able to identify this because this is not a, um, what do you call, a special ed room. Mm -hmm. This is a mainstream classroom. So I think that's where they're getting kind of just shuffled, and that's why you're getting these combines and different killings right. set up all the time because we're as regular citizens, we're not taking the time mm -hmm. to identify mm -hmm. problems that we should be. Yeah, yeah. Thoughts, feelings, behaviors, you know, those things, those are, mental health is tricky. Um, it's so subtle. It's, you know, um, the brain is a double-edged sword. It's a powerful thing. The, it can trick you into thinking that things are okay, things are fine, you're okay. Um, and that's where being around other people, that helps. That helps socialize you, gives you feedback in terms of what's going on with you. Where am I? How am I received? How do I interact with others? Um, and our feelings, those things that, you know, if we're irritable, if we're moody, if we're sad, those are indicators, okay, of where we are, as well as our thoughts. You know, where are we, is somebody out to get me? Is, you know, uh, I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. Uh, I'm never going to be here. I'm out to anything. I'm never going to accomplish anything. Those and that negative thinking can impact how we feel and act and behave. So, it's important to do outreach, important to have good sources of support, and that's why you guys are pivotal in my life, you know, um, having you guys to reach out to, get feedback from, just hanging out like we did, that was that was great, I needed that, I needed that, um, and you know, getting feedback and wisdom from those that we love, even when we don't like it, you know. <laughs> so, to I want to help the, uh, those who are in need. I just hope that the uh, people who are need the services are able to uh, connect with you, you mm -hmm. know, or you can help them. And that's that's going to be our challenge. That's the that's the stigma for you. I mean, that you didn't conduct yourself in a dignified manner, mm -hmm. and that's what I always heard from. I the think that, that uh, and leaders. I think that a lot of the young parents today, I think. Um, it was like a generation of kids that it's kind of like um, that were kind of lost for a minute. Like the ones after me, like my child's age group, that whole generation of kids, I don't, it, something happened in that era with with that has these little kids this these ages here. Something happened with that whole group and I'm not really sure what that was. I think that was a part of a lot of breakdown as far as respect and all that stuff that we were just talking about. A lot of that age group, when I talk to a lot of those kids, it's it's quite different than when I was growing up. Yeah. Well, you know what? I think that in the interest of time, I think this is the thing, though. We have to hear more from the kids. I mean, what was really remarkable about the whole Trayvon Martin thing is I didn't hear enough from how the youth were experiencing this. Mm -hmm. Okay? 
I didn't hear enough about how they were dealing with the reality of being young and black, being male and female, and what their experience was. And I think that we really have to hear more from them. I, I don't disagree with you. I think we have to hear more from them about what's going on. I think so, too. I like your point, uh, Lori, about like reclaiming. You know, the reality is, there are times when, you're right, as a community, we didn't have much in terms of finance or like wealth. But it didn't have anything to do with the soul of who we were. That's you know right. what I'm saying? And our ability, hey, if there's beans and rice, but we all still enjoyed each other and loved each other and like we're able to kind of have fun. And it's kind of like something that, um, I remember like Wesley Stipes had said at one point, he said, you know what, yeah, we were poor, but we didn't know that. We were just having fun. Kid, that 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 is an experience that kids definitely don't necessarily. That's not a part of their reality per se. If you if they can enjoy just who they are and the interactions with one another and the love that they have, yeah. that's the main piece to the whole thing. And they didn't know they were poor because they were making their own skates and making their own wagons. They just enjoyed doing that. Now, indeed, though, technology has changed things. Yeah. If I don't have the iPhone, if I don't have like the, the Jordans, or if I don't have this, and this is how we kind of got caught up in this thing. You gonna say something? You wanna say something, Dad? You not feeling good? Is it hot in here? Are you stuffy? You know, maybe some water. Yeah. Okay. Just some right next. To you. So, Grandma, education um, is an important thing because the lack of education, obviously, is something that um, leaves people with unproductive time and a lot of problems are rooted in that and so for us to be involved obviously in making sure that the educational piece is valued within the community is something that we need to be involved in um let me just go in reverse in the community piece patty is what you're talking about with that and i do think that that's one of the challenges is we're psychologists and we tend to be edict instead of emic which means we tend to focus on individuals as opposed to community and larger larger patterns in that way but because of the nature of who we are and who we're trying to meet, meet that is our attention mm -hmm. how do how do we go from being very individual focused to actually affecting a community um, and, and i would say you're right Wilfred, when you're talking about you know it's not about what you can add to something that's already warped but how can you actually regenerate and, and address the source of the problem at, at its root you know and that's where i think it, this is this is a ministry you know in that aspect it's like god God's manifold blessings, you know, are, are here in us, and it's designed to do that. It's designed to address those things, um, and we can't ha we can't see it differently. And I think if we see it differently, then we do miss that aspect of it too, because it is about okay, how can we how can we together make sure that these issues are addressed at, at its root cause? And how do you do that without a spiritual perspective in the midst of that? And I think that is something unique, to, not unique to our culture, but our culture is one that lends itself to that. So if we leave that out. We do miss that, and I think as psychologists, in the way that we're trained, that is our attention as well, making sure that that piece is there because it's culturally relevant. The new thing, I appreciate, um, Brand, what you're saying because what it reminds me of is that's a good reminder because we have to be careful not to interpret because there's no precedent that it won't work or that it's bad. I think you're right. We do know what doesn't work. We're trying to get a handle on what does work. What we know doesn't work is so much greater than what we know that does work. That when we branch out into new stuff, we kind of have we kind of have a big default category of it's not going to work, or at least we, it's very easy to become pessimistic about any new efforts. How do we then maintain that we need to keep that hope there, even though we're navigating waters that we haven't navigated before, but still trying to find out okay, somebody could have done this in some creative ways before, and drawing the past in the ways that it's helpful. But I do think you're right. I think that is a real challenge. There's going to be a default towards a pessimism because we've seen time and time again things that don't work. Um, and that is a challenge. Yeah. We don't even ask the right questions sometimes to even get outside of that, I think. Um, Mom, with the value, um, that is, I'm, I'm, I like how you put it. Um, we do need to... I never looked at that movie in that way. That's, that's good. We need to figure out how we instill value, the community instill value in our own in that way. Um, because I do think part of the problem in the way that I see it and I talked about it was exactly that. It's like, yes, we have a group of folk now, a group of young men, who actually are getting their messages from the broader community, the, the broader social society. 
And part of that message is that they're not valued. A piece of that is that they're not valued in the same way, but there's no room to even talk about that because we're supposed to be post-racial and that doesn't exist anymore. And we have to wake ourselves up and be connected with those young men in that way to, number one, make sure from day one that's never in question for them. And how to do that in the midst of all those social messages? Yeah. We stay in dialogue about it. Um, yeah. And, and Dad, you know, I would just say in, in terms of how, how you summed it up, I do think that's one of the things that, um, well, the, 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 yeah. The big challenge, I think, um, it, it, so it, I, I would put it this way. Education is a big piece. I, I do agree with Grandma. But there's so many things across the board that we have to be in sync with, you know, as a community. And, and I think that is one of the challenges, too, because I think with psychology, I think all of our view is not that we just, you know, psychology is the panacea for anything. But it is one of those things where um, we have to, it's even hard to, to figure out how to, how to describe it. We have to, put it this way, somebody comes into the office and sits down with me one-on-one, -on -one, great, we can make some headway. But like you said, Dad, I've got them for one hour and they're going out there and living 24-7 in a very different environment. Real progress is when they're connected to a community that's therapeutic, mm -hmm. right? And they're living in that context. And that's, the, that's what we have to figure out how to do, how to move it from the one-on-one -on -one sit down with me to, okay, maybe it's just that you're coming in so broken that this is where you have to start, but how do we get you to the place where you're connected to a community that can do the same thing? Mm -hmm. And we're, we're a ways from that. But that's where we're going to be. I think you captured my point of the course if we had all the time in the world of dialogue. Mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 the most basic primeval, the most basic fundamental, just absolutely primeval, you, you take anything, whether it be rats, mice, whether it be chimpanzees, whether it's people, you take them and you put them in a, a unique situation, put them in a box and don't give them any food, one will come out on top. And our prison system is such an institution, so much so, and it's such a money maker. And we, we heard the stories about, you know, uh, it, it is one of the most lucrative, if not the biggest, fastest growing industry in America today. Why? There's a reason for that, you see what I mean? So, you take a human being and you put them in this unique environment where it is do or die. Mm -hmm. and, and what you're literally creating is a, a, literally so many alpha wolves. Mm -hmm. Those alpha wolves, some will get out and some won't. We're, guess where they're coming back to? Yeah. They're coming back into the, the very same community they were born in. Yeah. And guess what? Now they're wolves and now communities become sheep, mm -hmm. right? They, they, the prospects of them getting a good job, right. probably not. They've been so conditioned. Now, the only thing they know is ruthless survival, right? And so they begin to prey on their own. And what they do, they get a collection now of young people. They are very good at influencing, you know, as well as dominating uh, uh, in, in uh, 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 community, you know. So it is important to, to how do you treat community? Now, one thing in, in, in reading what Amada is all about and going on looking at the website, at the community involvement. And it, and it, and it starts... It starts, That's the, I guess to say it that way, it starts. We must rebuild, we must treat community, and we and, 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 and as far as treating prisons, uh, prisoners now, that has, to, that has to start in prison. Mm -hmm. How are you going to treat a prisoner when, once they get out, when the only thing now, it's a wolf who's looking for a lamb to eat, you know, it's a Bible, they're not going to get a good job, and it's a matter of survival. Precious gift. Life is a precious gift. It is not to be taken for granted. It is not to be played with. Having said that, I want to say that God is always up to something. Absolutely. On our best days, we stare in the face of God and we miss Him. On our best days, He speaks thunderous words in our ears, but we don't hear Him. But today, we didn't miss Him. And He speaks today, and we hear Him. Uh, in your program, there's a definition of the word imada. Um, <laughs> they surprised me because I say, oh, I'll get a chance to go ahead and define it, but you see it right there. Uh, an African king from Ghana, uh, from the, uh, uh, a king tribe, uh, he looked at a certain cloth, and this cloth 
was so brilliant that he declared this has never been seen before. This pattern had never been done before. This pattern, which is a pattern of excellence, uh, with such character, with such innovation, Imada, and that's what this is all about. Um, that word, I want to share two more words with you. One is, and I'll say it just like it said in, in Ghanaian, it is, Gyi, 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 Niame, Gyi, Niame. It means except for God. It is the supremacy of God. I'll come back to that. There's another word that says, Niame Dua, Niame Dua, which is the tree of God, the presence and the protection of God. To the team of Amada, what we want for you is to be reminded that the presence of God is with you. We want to remind you that the supremacy of God, except for God, He's here with you. We want to remind you that you've embraced your responsibilities and what you guys are doing has never been done before. And I can go on and on and on at time will not us to permit. So if I can take just a few seconds to say and open the prayer, if we can bow. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for your love, your grace, your mercy for this occasion. We, play, we pray a blessing now, Lord. First of all, that this team, they prosper in you first and foremost. That they prosper in all that they do. That they prosper in who they are, what they are, where they are. We pray, Lord, blessings as they themselves are the healers, Lord, that they will be in good health and whole in their bodies, their minds, their souls, and their spirit. And we pray, Lord, that above all else, that they prosper in their souls. We ask this in the blessed name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I am so proud of this, this group of people. Um, I, was, uh, I was privileged to be in at the beginning when they were just talking about this and strategizing. And it wasn't a, it wasn't a brief. It wasn't just a, something that they were going to do. They had to strategize. It had to be, it had to be good for them. It had to be good for the community. So I want to first start by just presenting this, the certificate to them, and it was presented to them for an event they did in the Watts community, and that was their community is just so under underserved. But the one thing I just want to say is that every time they got the call, they responded. They responded to the radio, the radio um, shows, the Women's Health Forum, and through doing that, they've established credibility in the community. And I would not involve myself with any organization that that doesn't have credibility in the community. Uh, I'm so happy that they're they're doing successful and they're they're financially they're they're doing well. But if they're not healing people in the process, I don't want to be involved with that. I don't want to be involved with it. So. First, I would like to just present this one, this to you. Um, it was presented to Dr. Williamson and Dr. Bolden, but it's presented to the whole Imada firm because they all they all stepped up to the plate. So I just wanted them to get in this photo, everybody to get themselves in the group shot, and then and we'll get we'll get uh, Dr. Leg a little later. All right. yeah. Okay, so with that said, uh, I, I am, I'm just so proud of them. And you know, when we talk about healing, one of the things that they talked about in the beginning, and, and I, they were specifically focused on the African American community, but they, were, they weren't, they weren't, come on, Rick, come on down, you're They were just specifically focused on healing some of the issues in the African American community, which we know are, are just, we, we just got a lot of issues that we're dealing with that we need healing. We need healing. But they didn't close it off to anybody else. And that's one of the things that I'm so proud of you guys. And you see what the result of that, we know everybody of all colors are healed. They're, they're, they're hurting and they need healing. It doesn't matter what color you are. So again, I'm so proud of you. Uh, I want to say that um, I've seen you guys grow and mature over the last year. 
uh, I've seen you guys go through the process, man, and I don't, I don't even want to be a part of all that, but, <laughs> but uh, no, but I just wanted to end this day with a prayer for the families that have supported you, and, uh, you know, I just wish you well. So if we, everybody would just bow their heads. Lord, we just thank you for the families who are here to support uh, the Amada group, the members of the Amada group. Lord, we ask that you continue to lift them up, not just financially, Lord, but we just ask for blessings on their healing powers, Lord. And we just ask, Lord, that you just keep, you, you just stand by their side, Lord, and just uh, know that we support them. We support everything they do, Lord. We lift you up, we magnify your name, we give you glory, we give you honor, we give you praise. And we just ask, Lord, that as they travel, the family travels home, Lord, that you would bless each and every household, Lord. That you, you, would, you would prepare their homes for you, the way that they left them, Lord. And that when they get back, Lord, they will find them the way they are, Lord. And we just ask for your continued blessing. We just thank you and praise you in your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 I have three generations represented um, in my family here with me today. Um, I have my mom and dad, and, and they've sown so much into me and my sister um, coming up. All of this, uh, everything, who, who, who I am and, and all of my efforts and, and my personality, you know, they, they've helped beat out the rough edges and, and help instill the good stuff. Um, and I am who I am today because they never gave up. They continue to hold out a standard. <laughs> Um, and even when things were difficult, I moved all over the world, that standard was maintained. Um, but they didn't just hold the standard, they helped me get there. Um, and it's because that I stand on shoulders of people who are some tough folk um, that I am where I am today. And I want to bless you, Mom and Dad, for that. Um, and I want to thank you for um, just our family um, and everything that the both of you have, have instilled in us. Um, and we hope that you can just kind of see your efforts come to fruition and, and enjoy and that we would be a blessing to you. I want to acknowledge my sister as well and, and Wilfred um, along with me. I mean, friends, he's, he's like family for me. Um, you know, we need folks who know us before we get to where we are, not just to keep us humble. I was always amazed at how God raises people up together. When I look at people who are places where I'm like, wow, how did they get to that place? And they got a circle of people around them who are good folk, I see. The tides rise when you're attached to good people. And I feel like I definitely have benefited because of my connection with Wilfred, definitely my connection with my sister, who even though we're coast to coast, we pick the phone up and pick up just like we were kids, you know, for the most part. Um, and, and I don't undervalue that. That, that means the world to me. Um, and then the younger generation. Um, I'm not doing this, and this is not all about me. This is not all about us. There are folks coming up behind us, um, whether they're our own kids or the kids who just experienced us. It is important that the efforts that we do, we have to realize that that generation looks at us and we leave an impression. And the impression is either gonna be, hey, we respect you because you respect us and value us and value our parents, or we don't want anything to do with you. You know, And we've seen how those messages play out. And I just appreciate all the young folks here uh, because you know what, you're that constant reminder that we need to be about business. Um, and you're going to pick up the mantle someday and we need to pass on good reins to you. So we bless you for that. Um, so I want to uh, just uh, kind of look in here, but um, bless my family and friends here. Um, Mom and Hank just um, set the standard for me in terms of education. It was, um, you can't, couldn't just get a BA in my household. You had to get, everybody has a master's at least in the house, and you guys set the standard, and the next one, and the next one, the next one. And, and also in terms of telling me I could do it, um, setting examples of being pioneers, um, particularly Hank with um, the McDonald's and all that you did, and teaching me about business and marketing. Mom continuing to give me um, encouragement, telling me I can do anything. Being a woman of, of uh, professionalism, of power, going out there, um, really means a lot. I just, I mean, just to have you guys here, for you guys to see all of this. And then, um, all, well, all of my friends that are here, Rakisha, Allison, Sandy, Lisa, Donna, is he in this I think my husband. My husband and Kathy, I cannot tell you guys how much you've blessed me. I mean, I, I definitely, this is a group effort. I stand on, the, on your shoulders um, to be able to do this. Um, you give me the, the courage. You help wipe the tears when I'm frustrated. You give me the strength. You dust me off, and you help me get back out there. And so all of this is a collective um, effort, and I love you, and I'm so blessed by you, and may God bless you richly. Okay.
Uh, well, I think that when I think in terms of my family and uh, them coming out, I definitely want to thank each and every one of you for coming out. I mean, you know, it's, it's very clear that uh, we've got a chance to go through all of the academic, you know, hurdles and, you know, become doctors, psychologists. But you know what? I think that when I deal with family, I throw all that out the window. I throw it all out the window because it separates me from them. And they have just as much to offer me as I have to offer them. And I've definitely benefited from all the guidance and direction that you provided. And, you know, I still call them, you know, to this day to get advice and direction. And I embrace that. I embrace that because culturally that is fundamental in terms of who we are and what we have to remain, you know, adamant about. And that's the inclusiveness. And, you know, looking to our elders for guidance and direction. Okay? So be that with my, um, my mom and my dad. I think in terms of my significant other Lori, uh, my sister, uh, who has been steadfast uh, as a family member in terms of a rock and, and helping out with family issues, I think has been amazing. Uh, when I think about my dad and his perseverance and his willingness to kind of, you know, to kind of like, to push forward, you know, all the different like, challenges that, you know, he's experienced, it just, like, just gives me like more and more, um, uh, motivation, you know, to, uh, to, to to show them that I appreciate what they've done for me. And I just want to make sure that I recognize everybody. Uh, there are four generations here. Not that we're competing with them. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, um, you know it's, it's really been a blessing. And when I think about my daughter and her son, I mean, it just adds another dimension to things, and uh, I just really want to continue the blessings, and they don't stop with me, and hopefully they go on to my daughter and, you know, my grandson as well. So, but uh, it's, it's broader than just a family experience. It's all of those who are here and the inclusiveness that we have to have and how we have to embrace one another, and uh, I just want to thank the creator for that. I couldn't have said it any more better than Lisa, Rick, or Steve. Um, Without my family, without my friends, I would not be here. And it's important for me to be grounded in that sense. Uh, you guys mean the world to me. You know, you, you've gotten me to this point. Whether you know it or you don't, you've played a part in my growth and my development and me becoming the person that I am. And I really appreciate that. I really appreciate that. I want to acknowledge my mom. We had to leave early. But she has instilled so much in me from her experience, from her challenges, from her failures and, and her growths as well. She is just an amazing person and I look to her for wisdom, for knowledge, for guidance and without her I would not be here today. Um, she raised me as a single mother and that's a challenge. I don't say that in a good way. <laughs> it's a challenge and she rose through the occasion. But I had people in my life such as my Uncle Reggie, who stands behind you, um, who functioned much like my father um, in his absence, and he's a good man in his own right. But Reg, I love you, you know. Me too. I love um, what you guys are doing. I love what this is all about. This is just so great. So really, it's beyond uh, where you were and where you are now, and the family we've sort of adopted here. This is, <laughs> this is beyond anything I can... But thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, my friends, Ron, Jason, in college, oh my gosh, do they have stories to tell. <laughs> but um, Ron, my best man, you know, always there. He's my he's my earpiece. We get on the phone, we talk. Hey, man, I'm going through this. Hey, this happened at work today? Oh my gosh. He's like my therapist. So, yeah, I really appreciate him. Jason, the camaraderie. The brotherhood, he's always there. We're always there. And I'll mention another guy, Gus, He's a, who isn't here, but he's with us in spirit. He texts me, letting me know that he wasn't going to be able to make it here, but he is here with us. Then, you know, I want to acknowledge, I'll start with my wife and her family, but I'll, I'll start with my father-in-law, John. Johnny, he is the man. He's another father figure in my life as well. A righteous man, a man who is about character, a man who is about doing the things that the, the tough things when it's hard to do and his wife Deborah Mama Deb she's a therapist in training <laughs> she's awesome very insightful and 
I married good. Not just, you know, I got them as a bonus. They're the bonus, but I have to acknowledge my wife, Tamika. Tamika is incredible. She's a phenomenal lady on many fronts. Um, that's my soulmate, and I, I did right when I was able to choose her, and she chose me. And from that union, we have our son, Yeshea, and he's a big motivator for me. And I'm encouraged and I'm thoughtful about his growth and intentional about his growth and purpose and him coming up as a young African-American man. And just like Steve said, it's more than just this. It's about a community. It's about family. And you guys are all a part of that. I can't forget T.T. as well. She's standing here next to me. T.T. is a part of this too. And she's family. And we, we appreciate her and all that she brings to us. We thank you. We thank you. We want to acknowledge those who have come before us, those who have paved the way, those who gave sacrifices, known and unknown. We want to thank our God. We want to thank our Creator for giving us the time and the talent to be together. This is a unique deal. And working with these individuals, it's an incredible opportunity. And I am honored, I am blessed. We are all honored and blessed to do so and be of service, to be called, to be here in our community. We thank you, Father, for this opportunity. We thank you for this time in which we can come together as family, as friends, as peers, and celebrate this occasion. And let our lights be shine in, shine in the work that is done here. Let others see you in all that we do. Father, we thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for this blessing. Be with this place. Be with those that are underneath the sound of my voice. Watch over them. Protect them as they come in, as they go. Continue to bless us. Continue to keep us. It is these things we pray in your son Jesus' name. Amen.